I'm Carol Klein, and this is my home Glebe Cottage. When I'm not presenting or writing about gardening, this is where I spend most of my time and where I've been honing my horticultural skills for 40 years. Whether you've got a spacious plot, a tiny patio, or a few window boxes, there's nothing more exciting and satisfying than creating your own garden. From basic to more advanced techniques, I believe anyone can learn how to do it. Whether you're a complete novice or an experienced gardener, I want to help you develop the skills to make your garden grow. I'm ready. Are you? Hello and welcome back to my garden here at Glebe Cottage in Devon. It's ages since you were here and now the autumn's approaching. You can feel the whole garden is completely different. Everything's getting softer, more subdued, but richer and richer day by day. It's funny because sometimes people think about the autumn as just being a kind of corridor between the summer and the winter, but not a bit of it. It's its own very special season. And to me, it's one of the most delightful times of the year. As I look across the garden now, I, I can't see any of the paths at all. All you're aware of is, is these lovely sort of lolloping mounds and these great huge sprays of grasses. You can hardly see this bench. It's just been overcome by this huge millennia. You know, now it's all sort of purple and deep green, but very, very soon, It'll start to change and it'll become golden and mellow. But autumn's like that. It's the gentle season. But the flowers that really announce autumn are the asters, a group of plants that work really hard for us in this season. Well, this is the very, very first one to grace our gardens. It's Eurybia divaricata, the Michaelmas daisy. And divaricata just means sort of spreading out, splaying apart, and that's just what this plant does. Here it is planted at the top of the wall. You can't see the wall, and it mixes up with these ferns and all these other plants, the geranium coming through it too. It's just delightful. Its other name is wood aster, this is the sort of plant I love in my garden because it's easy going. It doesn't require any special treatment. It'll grow in most soils, sun or in shade. It's a really happy plant. Now, if you want to increase your asters, the usual way to do it is to divide them at the root in the spring. Because they flower late, it's much better. But there's another way you can actually grow new asters from cuttings. So this is a huge aster called Calliope. It has big blue daisies. What I love about it is these very, very dark stems. And I definitely want more of it. So I'm just going to snip a huge piece like this. So it's these little side shoots which are going to make lots of new plants. Should get several out of that. Look who's come to help. Well, Fifi's back for the autumn, aren't you? Hey, a little bit older, a little bit greyer, but just as beautiful. All I'm going to do is pull these little shoots off the side with a heel. It's just a little bit of the stem. All these will potentially have flower buds, but because I'll be nipping out the very top of the cuttings. It means they won't try and produce any flowers there and they should send out little side shoots too so we get a much bushier plant. So can you see this has got quite a big heel here? 
So I'll take some of the bottom leaves off, about to there. I'll nip out the top like that. So that's a nice sturdy little cutting. So I'm going to take my very sharp knife to neaten it up really, just so there are no extra bits which might make the cutting rot. So that's fine. I've got some clay pots because I always prefer clay pots for taking cutting. Things root much more readily in them. And I fill them with nice gritty compost and I'm just using my favourite chopstick pushing this cutting down so it's it's that bare bit of stem is just under the surface of the soil and then firming it in and I'm going to proceed right around the pot. There's my hole, push them in. They don't want to touch each other in the pot whilst they're rooting. It's just a degree of separation between them all and the next one. This is lovely. It's my first bit of awesome propagation. That familiar noise of the shovel in the gravel and just right over the top of there because that keeps in the moisture, keeps down the weeds and it stops your cuttings from rotting too. And then I'll take them to a nice warm, bright place, but not in direct sunlight. And I water them really, really thoroughly. And it's lovely to be taking stuff from the garden, making more plants, and then I'll return them to the garden. Why not try this yourself? First, take some side shoots from the parent plant. Make holes around the rim of a compost-filled pot Gently push in the cuttings, firm them in, and water well, straight forward. Taking cuttings is just one way to increase your plants. Back in the spring, I gave another member of the daisy family a new lease of life. And it's a plant I just couldn't be without in the autumn. It's quite heavy. <laughs> <laughs> Walking down here, you're aware that everything's changing. Everything's becoming more and more autumnal. I love heleniums. They flower for ages and ages, and they're very, very easy. They're straightforward plants to grow, very accommodating, providing they have sunshine, reasonably well-drained soil, and they'll keep on going year after year after year. The clumps get bigger and bigger. This is El Dorado, and it has to be one of my all-time favourites. The flowers are big and bold. In the spring, I dug some up and divided them to make more plants. I got rid of the old woody centres, leaving just the fresh, healthy pieces around the outside edge. Then I planted each division in a clay pot, and they flourished. But now it's time to give it a, a proper home in the garden, in the ground. Up you come. I tell you what, in this garden it's really quite difficult finding spaces for new plants. And there's a space here. I'm in luck in just the right place. So I'm just going to attempt to dig a hole that's deep enough for this leaning to go in. A lot of people think that spring is the only time you can plant, but in actual fact, at this time of year, the soil's warmed up and plants still have a window to get established. Yeah, should be okay, that. And I'm grabbing it by all those stems. Look at that! <laughs> oh, 
that's what you call a root ball. But if this is going to get established, I'm going to break them because each one I break will actually make loads of new fibrous roots and they're the roots that actually feed the plant. So that will do if I very carefully lower this. Well, that was obviously meant to be. Look at that, just right. So I've got room for a little bit of extra compost. Here we go. I'm just going to put some of this in here. So I want it in close and intimate contact with this soil. I must give it a really good soak. We always associate autumn with fruitfulness and it's the time at which seed is dispersed. How wonderful to get out beyond my garden to see one of our native plants doing just that. Come on. <laughs> just look at this, isn't it wonderful? You can't imagine anything being more covered in seed, ready to blow around all over the place. And this is where it belongs, at the edge of a field. This is creeping thistle, Circium arvensi. And arvensi just means living in a field or on ploughed land. And that's where this plant absolutely loves to live. There are lots and lots of tiny flowers that go together to form each of these flower heads. And once it's pollinated, then this thistle down will be produced. First of all, you get these lovely purple thistles. And they're actually incredibly sweetly scented, the smell of honey. And every one of these heads of thistledown will have been visited by hundreds of insects who've pollinated it and then turned it into seed. If you'd pick up some of this fluff, you can see each one has a seed and each one is its own separate parachute. just flies off into the air and lands somewhere far away from the parent plants. Creeping thistle is a very invasive plant, so I'm definitely not suggesting you grow it in your garden. But insects relish the nectar, and many birds depend on its copious seed for nourishment. If this crops up in our gardens, we all want to get rid of it, but it doesn't stop us marvelling. Uh, the, the way in which this plant distributes its seed. I'm not going to collect any of this seed, but there's lots in the garden that I'm just itching to get my hands on. I'm heading off to my new cutting garden where there should be loads of seed ready to collect. need a great big expanse if you're going to try and grow cut flowers for the house. So way back in the spring, I decided I'd designate a small bed here to just that purpose. So I grew some stuff from seed, some I planted directly like the sweet peas. It's been a huge success. I've been picking bunches of flowers from here all summer long. So many of the best flowers for cutting are members of the daisy family. Rebecca and masses of cosmos too. Well, some of this stuff has seen better days. It's just beginning to go over now, but a lot of it has set seed and I want to collect some of it so we can do just the same thing next year. All sorts of seed heads here, but this was the one I was particularly keen on. It's called Scabiosa stellata, and I ordered it for its blue flowers, and I hadn't realised that it would actually do this. Isn't that lovely? These seed heads are just beautiful. The very best time to take any sort of seed 
is just when nature itself would be distributing it. So when that seed is ripe and it's ready to fall or fly or be catapulted, that's the moment you step in with your secateurs, snip it, put it into a paper bag and carry it away to grow loads and loads more plants. Whatever seed it is, you need a dry day, no point doing it in the damp. And the best time to do it is sort of midday-ish, when the seed heads are as dry as they possibly can be. But there's something really lovely about growing something from seed then and tracing its lineage back in your own garden. It's an absolute delight. It's something my mum used to do too. So it's nice, isn't it? Carry on a family tradition. There's my beautiful scabious heads there. But I've got a little selection here of some of the seed heads from around the garden. There are so many ways that nature has evolved to actually make the seed. I mean, take something like this. This is a salvia. So here, all of these seed capsules go in whirls right the way up the stem. So they're going to shake, rattle and roll and send themselves all over the place. Sometimes the, the seed is contained in a, a, a little column like this. This is a, an eryngium, a sea holly, and all these are separate seeds that will eventually fall out, protected by this, this great sort of armoured, barbed collar. So back to the scabies that I've just snipped. No, here goes. Ooh. Look at that. They were really ready to disperse themselves or they wouldn't fall off so easily. This little dainty, perfect shuttlecock. It's, it's just gorgeous. On a windy day, that little parachute would take it off in different directions. But not these. These are going straight into their pots. I'm dying to sew them. While I'm down this way, I've forgotten all about this campanula. It's one of my favourite, favourite plants. It's um, a campanula latifolia and it's called gloaming and it's got these soft grey lilac flowers and this seed is more than ready. Sometimes you can just snip seed and carry it off. But in the case of anything like campanulas, aquilegias, poppies, where the seed just rattles around in its seed capsule and you're in danger of losing the seed as you actually try and get it off. It's a good idea to sneak up on it with a paper bag. Right over the top. That's it. I'm going to come down as far as I can and then I'm going to grab it. <laughs> and I'll snip it there. Can you hear it? <laughs> It's captured. Hooray. There's masses of it. And I'd quite like to give some of this seed away because a lot of people have admired this plant. That's a great thing about seed. It's so easy to pass your plants on that way, isn't it? Like then digging them all up and putting them in a pot. <laughs> I often sow some of my seed in the autumn, even though daylight decreases and the temperature drops. It means they'll grow more slowly through the winter, but it's a way to have some plants ready earlier in the spring. What we want to do is sow our lovely scabious. There's a module tray here just with ordinary compost in it. So just one seed per module. You can just pick it up by this little skirt and push it into the compost. It's great, but I don't bury it under loads of compost. So as per usual, I'm going to cover these with a bit of grit, just a little covering because I don't want them to rot. And then I just want to label it, water it, Give it a little bash there. 
With this, I'm going to water from the top. Nice big seeds, I'm not going to wash them away. Next, I'm going to sow the tiny seeds of my Campanula using a half seed tray. I love these because it gives me a bigger surface area. I can sow my seed quite sparsely on here and it's really easy to prick out because those roots only need to go down a little way before you start lifting them out and potting them into something else. It's quite nice because here it comes. Oh, oh. This is lovely because the seed is really pale. So I'm going to be able to see exactly where I've sown this on here. So not too thickly. A, a sort of couple of inches above the surface of the tray. Because if you do it too close, it tends to, you get little clumps of seed and you don't want that. I always go round the edge and then into the centre. So I've got all bases covered there. I'll give this a little press down. And then more grit. You just want a fine, even layer of it. But because there are all these little separate pieces, the light can still get through. Another press down with that. Another label. I'm just going to stand the tray in some shallow water and I'll wait for that to sort of percolate to the top. So once it's watered and drained, I'll put it into my greenhouse. You could just use a, a, a windowsill at home as long as it's reasonably warm and it's got some light to help that seed germinate. And then next year, I'll be able to plant them out in the garden. When I'm sowing seed, I use individual modules for larger seeds. I sprinkle smaller ones onto a half tray filled with compost. And I always finish off with a sprinkling of grit. Next, I'll be getting to grips with a gorgeous edible produce in my autumn garden. Mm. Couldn't be much fresher than that, could it? <laughs> Veg growing has always been a really important part of our garden life at Cleve Cottage. I think the whole idea that you can actually grow stuff that you can eat is right by the house. It's absolutely fresh, you know just what's on it and in it. So my veg garden this year has had lots of ups and downs, let's put it like that. In the spring, it was all about preparing for the growing season ahead, digging trenches for my spuds, planting out shallots in ridges. You can just see the top of the onion poking out and sowing squash and courgette seeds. Come summer, it was time to harvest, pulling up the first of my potatoes, picking aubergines and plenty of perfectly plump courgettes. But there's still loads and loads of stuff to harvest. And it's the autumn that you really do associate with actually reaping the benefits of what you sowed earlier on or planted. We grow lots of traditional things, beetroot and parsnips. But earlier this year, I thought we'd try planting something that's a bit different, something really rather special. And I want to see how it's getting along. So these are my globe artichokes, of which I'm very proud, even though they haven't done a great deal so far, but they were only planted this spring. It's one called Violetta di Chioggia, and I really wanted to grow this variety because these heads are deep purple, and it's supposed to be one of the most delicious. So I'm just going to snip this one off. 
Because it's a perennial vegetable, it'll come up year after year after year. And each year, these clumps will get bigger and bigger and yield more and more harvest. And what you would do with any perennial plant that's produced its flower or seed head, you cut it right down to the base so that the plant doesn't expend any more energy on this leafy growth here, because what you want it to do is to concentrate on making new shoots at the bottom. So nice sharp pair of secateurs, and I'm just going to cut right down there. Very satisfying. And there's nothing at all left at the base. But if I move to this one, you can already see around here, there are all these lovely new shoots now. And there'll be even more in the spring and the whole plant will be more robust. But let me show you a few of these other ones that I've grown from seed. Last year, only two out of five of the artichoke seeds I sowed germinated. But I want more, so I've had another go. First of all, I put them out into a seed tray but then I move them on individually into these modules and they've made fine little plants now. And all I'm going to do is lower this very well-rooted little plantlet <laughs> into a, a litre pot full of good potting compost. This will keep going right the way through the winter and by the spring I should have a nice chunky little plant. A final touch is to put grit onto the top of these. They'll need a bit of protection over the winter. With any young plants, even if they're as tough as old boots, it's always a good idea to give them a helping hand. In another part of the garden, I've grown a close relation to the edible artichokes. Just look at that. It is a majestic plant, isn't it? These beautiful, great, big, thistly heads. I love that colour too, all those purple petals. It's gorgeous. Now this is a cardoon. It's first cousins to our globe artichokes. I've never tried eating this. It looks a bit too prickly, really. But what I love about it most is how it comes into its own at this time of year. It's such a, a statuesque plant. I mean, all this was knee-high until about sort of June, July, it started to grow, and now they're all battling for space and at the same time really enjoying each other's company. I also planted something else from the daisy family, one you can eat. Look how tall they are now. These are our Jerusalem artichokes. What do they remind you of? They're actually related to some flowers. In fact, one of their names is girasol, which is the Italian for a sunflower. And if you look behind, there's a perennial sunflower there. It's a helianthus called lemon queen. If these ones had enough sun and a long enough growing period, they too would produce yellow flowers. But it's not for the flowers we're growing them. It's for what's under the soil. In fact, they're so prolific when they get going, they produce lots and lots of tubers. But there's one. Got a small fork, so I do less damage. Well, these are nowhere near ready to harvest, but it's nice to see what's actually going on under these enormous shoots. If they're growing well, you can see these long tubers that just get pushed out, just as they would on a potato, sort of thicker root, and then the tuber, and then they'll move further on across the soil. Perhaps in a few weeks' time, we can come back and actually harvest some of them and make some soup. When you take them out, they should be that sort of size. And they'll have changed colour slightly too, because they'll be that much older, they'll be quite brown. But the great thing is, you can just leave them in the ground all winter and take what you want, when you want. But there's another kind of vegetable that definitely is ready for harvesting. 
I love beetroot and they tend to grow short rows and sow it very, very frequently so we can be eating it fresh for ages and ages. I'm going to pull out a couple of these beetroot because they're just about ready. These are going to go straight in the pot. I love them, cooked, sliced, and then in loads and loads of vinegar because I really, really like vinegar. But look at this. Can you see? It's rocket, <laughs> and I planted it in amongst my sorrel, and now it's made these lovely fat seed pods. And I've taken a few off, and what I did with some of these earlier was just to open these up. Now, they're not brown yet, they're still green, as you can see, but if I split them open, lots and lots of green seed. So you can let those ripen, or you can sow them green, and I actually took a few green ones because I was a bit impatient and I sowed them just a couple of weeks ago and this is them. So I just did a little sprinkle and I did it in modules so that I can plant them straight into the ground or I can leave them in situ in this tray and I can just crop them as a, a sort of cut and come again crop and we'll be able to keep cutting it for weeks and weeks. It's so tender, lovely. Mm. Be much fresher than that, could it? <laughs> Aren't these lovely? They're so handsome and they're so autumnal too. They're the seed heads of Nigella Damascena, loving the mist. And it's just as pretty in seed, I think, as it is in flower. They make wonderful decorations, but I've got a, a purpose for these. I want to take the seed and sow around the garden. And if you hold it, it really does rattle. It's wonderful. And that's a sign that those seeds are ripe and they're just about ready to disperse. So if I just take a bit of this, fluffy bits off here. That was that nice sort of feathery ring of little fine leaves that went around the flower. That's why it's called love in a mist because you've got these lovely blue flowers and then this soft green edge. Now I'll just split this asunder and hopefully you'll be able to see all those black seeds falling out. So into the bowl, probably about 50 seeds or so in there. This seed is going to go right back in the garden straight away. It's a hardy annual, so it has a, a year's life cycle. If you do it at this time of year, you get earlier flowers next year. I'm going to give a sprinkle it hither and thither around the garden where I want these lovely blue flowers. gingerly into there. Now in this bed down here, quite a few of the perennials have been cut back exposing some of the bare earth and it's the perfect place to broadcast a bit of seed. So here goes. And all broadcast means is throwing it around because what you're creating is a whole sort of naturalistic look. There's something really lovely about doing this because um, you've got no control over it at all. It's completely random. You've no idea where it's going to come up, what it's going to look like. It's quite nice, isn't it, not to plan them. I mean, a bit down there as well. So hopefully there'll be this drift of blue that runs right the way through the middle of this bed. Yeah, that's it. Some of it will germinate, some of it won't. <laughs> but there'll be enough plants to really create a very pretty picture come about May, June time next year. Trying this out couldn't be easier. Take a decent pinch of seed and strew it over a suitable patch of bare earth. Job done. 
And wait till you see where I'm headed next. Aren't these just scrumptious? They're delicious. This morning, there's a bit more of a nip in the air. You can really tell that autumn's on its way. And I can smell wood smoke. That always, always reminds me of this season. And in this new little cut flower border, there's lots of work to do. I want to deadhead all these cosmos because look how beautiful these flowers are now. But if I want to keep them going for months and months, then deadheading regularly really does a, ensure that you get loads more flowers. So I want to move in and I want to cut any heads which are definitely over. All you do is come down to the next point at which flowers are produced. I'm going to snip that one off too. And on this one, there are more buds to come, so more flowers. That'll ensure this cosmos is going to flower right the way till the first frosts. It's really important that you use a sharp implement. If you tear this down and just nip this off with your fingers and it's quite likely it'll rot. It's not just in the autumn that you're deadhead, but if you start in the summer and you go right the way through, it just means that your garden always looks a bit more pristine than it otherwise would. It's so worth doing. Whatever size your garden is, whether it's vast or a courtyard or even a window box, all as gardeners are interested in keeping a succession of flower and colour for as long as we possibly can. And one of the very best ways of doing that is to make use of pots and containers to really keep colour going right through the autumn. And I've got in mind a couple of unusual receptacles that are in need of a revamp. These two magnificent iron pots stand at the foot of the steps up to the front of the house. And every year we try and change whatever's in them. And this time I want to plant something that's specifically for the autumn that's going to take us on with that gorgeous colour right the way through oh, into November or so. But if you're growing stuff in a pot, it really is important to refresh the compost before you start planting anything new. Now, the, the compost that's in these pots is really good stuff. It's a mix of peat-free, lots and lots of loam in here, lots of grit, a bit of fertiliser. What I'm going to do is top this up as I plant with the same sort of stuff. But now, enter the plants. Aren't these just scrumptious? They're delicious. I think when you're planting any container at all, it's a really good idea to put them together, see what looks nice, take things out, add different things, until you come up with a, a recipe that's really going to work. So the sort of leading role in, in my box is going to be taken by this lovely Echinacea. Typically for autumn plants, they're members of the Asteraceae family, they're daisies, and they'll go on flowering for ages and ages. So I'm going to marry them up with this big grass. This is a Penicetum alopecuroides, and it's called Black Beauty because it's got these gorgeous dark inflorescences. You can see these buds here. So this is going to keep on looking gorgeous for ages and ages. And then in the foreground is a sedum. <laughs> I love sedums, especially during the autumn. That's when their flowers are at their peak. This is Sedum atropurpurum Carl Funkelstein. Good name, isn't it? And it's got masses of these plateaus of tiny little flowers. It's also got gorgeous purple foliage. I think it tones beautifully well with the rubecchia, 
with the plumes of that grass, and I think they're going to look good together. I want to plant them there. I'm going to start with the grass, with this panacetum. And sometimes, both in containers and in a broader, it's a temptation to put the tallest things at the back. But this is going to be viewed from several different sides. So I'm going to put it, not bang in the middle, but with a, a couple of things behind it as well. And <laughs> invariably, when you've got a big grass like this growing in a pot, you've got this huge tangle of roots and I'm just going to break them up. And the whole reason for doing this is to make sure that once this is planted, those roots are going to move out into that compost. It doesn't want to stay going round and round in circles. That'll do. And look at your plants and try and sort of suss out which way round it's going to look best. Although we've got two of our echinacea, we don't really want symmetry here at all. We just want to create this autumnal feel. Just look at this deep colour here and see how it, it fades so beautifully. It's almost like a a watercolour where you've just got your brush and wash the colour through. Now I think that's going to look good there. So I've I'd potted this one on just to keep it growing but look here are the lovely fibrous roots underneath and that means it'll be easier to get in the pot too. That's about it because I'll fill in when I've got everything in place. The same is probably true of this one. Đám say nước mắt chảy ngược phía chân mây trong ngóng đời chờ người chung vây cớ sao em cách xa nơi này ngàn vàng thương đau người có hay nơi vô thương người vô duyên đàn chim trời ùa về với nhau còn có đôi người xa rời người ngồi tương tư hạt ngọc đêm rơi ta tơi lòng ta xót Look at that, it's joyous isn't it? Come on Carl, it's your turn. <laughs> Sedums will grow in quite poor soil and I won't feed this one. So that can sit in that corner and I think maybe there's just a couple of spaces for something trailing over the top. I'm going to use another Carl II, this, and he's going in this corner. So it'll just look out at you like that. So all that remains is to top this up with compost. It's absolutely crucial to ensure we really make the best of the plants we've put in there. So loads of this, and that's going to ensure that we get an autumn feast for the eyes right the way through until the cold days of winter begin. It's such a lovely feeling. Just as the garden is quieting down, everything's getting more subtle, more peaceful, to inject <laughs> this marvellous colour and actually create something that's completely different and new. It really is lovely. And what's more, it's not just new, but it epitomises the season. Awesome. Next time, we'll be swishing through glorious autumnal grasses. The whole thing will go completely golden. Absolutely beautiful. And in the veg garden, there'll be squashes, spuds, and a dahlia that thinks it's a potato. See you next time.